you know, before we start the message, I want, uh, I want to read a special handwritten message from Pastor Jerry that he wanted me to make sure that, he, that I, I read to you guys. And this is coming straight from him, letter by letter. And it says, it is really different not being with you all this morning. It is the first time in 25 years that I'm not delivering a Mother's Day message with our church family. He attached scripture to this letter and it says, it's in Exodus 20, 12, that says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God is giving you. The pastor goes on to say, he says, Peggy and I wanted, wanted you to know that we love you and are really thankful and proud of the God-fearing moms in our church. So this morning, we choose to honor you. We wish you a great Mother's Day and are asking God's blessing on this day and on your year. May God be with each of you. Happy Mother's Day. Love, Pass, and Peggy. That is, a, that is a letter from our pastor, which we all know that has a heart of gold. The Lord has given him this love to share with all the people, with all the, con the congregation. And 25 years, this is the first time in 25 years that he has not delivered a Mother's Day message, which tells me no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Praise the Lord that if the Lord in Scripture can use a donkey, He definitely can use someone like me. Amen. Amen. So with that being said, uh, today is Mother's Day, and we want to honor our mothers. We want to make sure that. We let them know today that they are appreciated. We want to thank them, thank them for everything they did for us growing up. I got a bad echo here. Growing up in those times when we weren't so kind. Uh, I'm blessed today. My mom's here with me today. Amen. I want to tell my mom, thank you. Thank you for being that mom that displayed love to me all the time, even when I didn't deserve it. Because I know you guys might think I was perfect when I was a kid, but I was. <laughs> I was far from it. And I put my parents through, through a lot. But I thank God that the Lord put uh, this love in my mother's heart to never give up on me. And I thank her for that. Thank you, Mom. And that's how we are to thank our, our mothers. But not only our mothers, but our wives also, right? Our wives, which are the mothers of our, of our kids, play a big role. Without them, can you imagine us, us as men raising kids? Doing all the raising and uh, the correcting and just demonstrating the love the way moms do it? I don't know if I could. I, I lack in that department. But that's, and what we're going to see today, that's part of God's plan. And the reason why the Lord instituted marriage, and he made women to be mothers. To be able to demonstrate that love and that mercy when we as men, as the spiritual leaders of the home, can. Amen? So if you would, we're going to start in the beginning, and we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. We're going to start there. While you guys are, are uh, turning to Genesis 2, I want to read Proverbs. And there's a couple of scriptures that the Lord gave me when I was preparing this study, and it pertains to mothers. 
Proverbs 23, 25. You don't have to turn there, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Proverbs 23, 25 says, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Proverbs 31, 26 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Proverbs 31, 27. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Mothers play a big role in a family. Mothers are always busy with making sure that none of the children or husband go without. Sometimes that position is overlooked. Right? And we take our mothers, we take our wife for granted often too much. And we don't realize what it takes to establish a home. What it takes if, if the mother is in the home, praise the Lord, because they're going to get that sweet, genuine love that only a mother can get. And sometimes we overlook that. We take that for granted. We just, we just think that, you know what, our wives and our mothers are going to be there forever. But that's not the case. We are to cherish those that we love every single day. We are to make sure that we let them know that they are appreciated. That they're not just there, you know, cooking the food, cleaning, washing clothes, going to work, you know, having a career, providing financially. But we want to let them know how important they really are. They're far above all that. They're our mother. They're our wife. Not only that, the Lord put them in our path. The Lord created this family. The Lord created your family. It was by no accident. So we need to honor the Lord first in that. And then we need to honor our parents. Amen? Amen. Uh, Genesis 2.18. Like I said, we're going to go way back, way, way back. The scripture says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. I'm going to stop there. When I was reading this verse, that word, a helper comparable him. What does that mean to us? The word helper, comparable, if we look at it on the surface, it means that it can be taken like, well, our wives are to help us, right? And that they're comparable to us, so they're kind of like us, right? But that's not the case. If you dig into this word a little more, it reveals a different meaning. In the Hebrew, it's broken down into two words. The word, the two words are ezer and ego. The word ezer applies 21 times in the Old Testament. And it refers to our Lord Jesus Christ. It, re it, it, it refers back to our Father. Right? That word, ezer, represents helper, savior, But the word connecto has a different meaning. That word connecto means to surround, protect, aid, rescue, and also provide. Which leads us to believe and to know that if we read this scripture in context, our wives are our easer connecto. They're our provider, they're our helper, they're our protector, and our rescuer. And our wives have the ability to turn us back from whatever decision that we sometimes want to make. Because the Lord put a certain love into woman that is different than the man. 
It's, it's different, different in the way how they love their children, their children, how they love their husbands, and how they love even friends outside the family. That word ezer kenegdo has a different meaning when you read it this way, instead of just helper comparable to him. It's much deeper. The woman's role in the marriage, in the house, as a mother, is to protect, to rescue, provide, guide, and to turn back from whatever danger or whatever decision that we are about to make. Knowing that, it kind of sheds light on the word wife, on the word mother. Have you guys ever heard that term, don't mess with mama bear? Right? That love that our moms, that our mothers possess is a love like no other. It's a, it's a type of love that it's ready to, it's ready to kill for when somebody messes with their loved one. It's a type of love that no matter who's looking, who's around, what the circumstance or the situation is, they're ready to lay it all down on that. Amen? And I see it sometimes when, when I uh, try to discipline my kids and it's not the correct way. Oh, believe me, Mama Bear gets mad. And Mama Bear is ready to protect, right? <clears throat> right to so because she holds that position. Our mothers, which are wives, are not only just a helper, but they are easier to negative. Now, if we go, if we turn back to, uh, let's go back to Genesis 2, I mean, I'm sorry, 18, starting in verse 10. And so now that we've established the wife's role in the marriage, in the home, as a mother, and as a wife, and as a provider, as a, as a, a, a you know, the, the, the one person in the home that always makes sure that you go, that you do not go without. I remember when I was young, my mom always worked. And my mom worked long hours. And I know she was tired, because I could tell she was tired. But we never, ever, not one single day, and I can say this with all certainty, we never, ever miss a hot meal. Because the love that my mom had, that the Lord put in her heart, was to provide a hot meal for us every single day. I don't care what type of day she had at work, how many hours she worked, how tired she was, or, what, or even when she was sick. She always made sure that she fed us with the hot meal. And it wasn't leftovers. It was a meal made from scratch. That's the love that my mom always displayed to us. Genesis 18.10 says, we're going to look into the life of Sarah. And because uh, though women possess, mothers possess this special love, Right? But at the same time, they are not perfect, and we know that. We know that because our moms are still human. Sometimes they make mistakes. And we're going to see here in the life of Sarah that, that uh, you know, she displayed doubt when the Lord was speaking. Verse 10 says, And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, 
after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, but no, you did laugh. Now before we go into this, we know that three men visited Abraham in that tent that day. We know that two of them were angels of the Lord. And that third person was Jesus Christ himself. He was the Yahweh of the Old Testament. Now, that day, there was two forms of laughter. Abraham laughed for joy at the message that he had just received from the Lord, that he was going to have a son, and the promise that was behind that. And the second, second, time, uh, second type of laughter was the laughter of fear. How many of us sometimes laugh when we're afraid, or we try to make jokes? You know, we try to make a joke out of it, but we're really kind of scared, right? I'm a funny guy sometimes, because sometimes I'm scared, right? And uh, that's how I kind of get through that fear and that doubt, is through <coughs> laughter, making a joke. But in my heart, I'm afraid. So I can be pretty funny sometimes. And this is how Sarah was, this is the attitude that she had. She was afraid. But I like how the Lord says, and I ask yourself this, ask yourself this question right now, in whatever situation you're facing, whatever uh, trial you're going through, or whatever trial you just came out of, is anything too hard for the Lord? we have it here in his word and we believe his word as a whole right then why would why do we fall into that why do we put a limit on the Lord if the Lord himself is asking is anything too hard for the Lord with a question mark why do we doubt sometimes why do we limit God why do we say to ourselves you know what Lord you, you can't fix this this is too far gone The Lord is displaying his power. He is telling Sarah, you're going to have a child. Even though she's well advanced in age, even though you think it's not humanly possible for that to happen, the Lord is saying, is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for me? Me being the giver of life. The one that gives life and the one that takes it, is anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. But it does require something. In order for this to be true, and in order for this to work in our lives, it requires something. It requires faith. Now we can all say, boy, I got faith. You know, my faith is strong. But your faith is not faith until it's tested. Your faith is not faith until you're going through that trial. So here's another question. What type of faith do you have? We all have this faith that, for example, we have faith that that, that chair you're sitting on is going to hold you, right? That when you sit down, that chair is going to hold you. Right? But the minute that chair breaks and the chair doesn't hold you, then your faith is gone. That is not faith. That is not the faith that the Lord requires of us. The Lord requires faith, the type of faith that is, even when you can't see how it's going to turn out, you cannot see right in front of you, 
that you still believe. And that you know, because you know, that the Lord is going to work it out. In Hebrews 11, 11, Sarah, though she doubted in the beginning, right? And she also feared. But then demonstrated the faith of the Lord required of us. Hebrews 11, 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds are, were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, by this unshakable faith, Sarah received strength. By this faith that we cannot see or touch or understand, Sarah received strength to conceive a child. Even though she was well advanced in age, and in medical terms, everything was stacked against her. In rationality, it just doesn't make sense. But it's that type of faith that even when everything doesn't make sense, if the Lord said it will come to pass, then it will come to pass. That's the faith that God is talking about. That is the faith that gave Sarah the strength. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithfully who had promised him. What do we do when we judge someone? What do we do when we cast judgment on something or someone? We, we, give, we give our, uh, how can I say? When we judge somebody, we give them our thoughts or we give them what we think of that person, right? When we judge, we make a choice that we think of this person this way. We make a choice that we believe that this person is like this, or that we believe that this person can do this or cannot do this. Sarah judged him faithfully. Sarah chose to put her faith in our Lord. We have a choice. Our whole Christian walk is about choice. There is choices from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. Everything is led by choice. When you wake up in the morning, choose whom you're gonna to serve today. Right? Choose who you're gonna put in front. Choose who's gonna have that priority. Choose who's gonna have that number one spot in I was reading, I, I did a prayer breakfast yesterday, and I was reading in Luke 7, and on, on that topic of choosing where you put the Lord in, our, in your life, and I was sharing with the men that the Lord impressed in my heart as I was praising him and thanking him for what he's done in my life. He impressed it in my heart, and he asked me, he goes, where do I stand? What position do I hold in your life, my son? That's a pretty tough question. And like I told the men yesterday, it's a tough question, but it's a necessary question. Luke 7, 1. You guys don't have to go there, but I'll read to you guys. It says, uh, it says, Now when he concluded all his sayings, and he, <clears throat> in the hearing of the people, he meaning Jesus, entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. 
for he loves our nation and he and has built us a synagogue. The centurion's servants were met up with Jesus and told Jesus, Lord, this person that you need to come and save and come and heal, he's deserving. He has built synagogues. He loves our nation. They're pleading for him. He deserves to be saved. Well, let me ask you a question. Who here deserves to be saved? Who here can honestly come to the Lord and say, Lord, I've done this, 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 and this for you. Therefore, I deserve for you to save me. None of us. None of us. It goes on to say, then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But you say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say, one to, I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in him. The centurion, being a Roman soldier, we know that the word centurion means a hundred. Right, so this was a high-ranking official in the Roman army, which in scripture probably had about a hundred men under him. And all he had to do was say the word, and things were done for him. All he had to do is just look in a certain direction, and men were already on top of him. But notice the attitude that the centurion had with Jesus. He's saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy. That you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, my servant will be healed. And he goes on, and he, the centurion goes on and says, I also have authority. I also have authority here on earth. But what he's really saying is, Lord, I'm set in a position of authority here, but even the authority that I hold here on this earth does not match the authority that you have. Amen. Even though I have authority here, it does not match the authority that you should have over my life. Sometimes us as humans, we, we hide behind our positions at work, we hide behind the things that we've done, and think that that's enough. Just like this man, when they were pleading for him, he has built a synagogue. He loves the nation. He deserves to be saved. Can we truly come to the Lord with that? With that type of, uh, type of attitude? This centurion, having authority, have being a powerful man, realized that he is nothing. He is nothing compared to the authority of God. So I, I ask you again, where does the Lord stand in your heart today? What position does he hold in your life, in your heart? Is he number one? Or is he number two? If he's number two, he might as well be last. Because the Lord requires and desires to be the only one. That is the only way, and that is the only time, the Lord being a perfect gentleman, that he'll come in and work in your life. When that realization is made to you, to me, first, that I am nothing without him, and that he needs to be Lord of all. He needs to hold that number one position. From the minute I wake up to the minute I go to sleep. 
his members should be taken off that list. Jesus says he, he marveled at that faith because he said he had never even seen that, found that great faith, even in Israel. Because us as humans, we like to hide behind our accomplishments. We like to hide behind our knowledge. Well, the Lord wants to expose all that. The Lord wants to remove all that. Because when it comes to the Lord, we're all on the same playing field. Right? None of us are deserving of anything. No matter how many missions that we've gone through, how many messages we've preached, how many times you've shared the gospel. Though important, but that hasn't been saved us. What saves you is having that, giving the Lord that proper authority, that proper position. And until that happens, until that happens, your faith is not established. You cannot develop that faith that is being talked about. go back to Hebrews 1. Now we, we read that <clears throat> now the faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. Now that word it represents faith. It says, for by it, for by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. It's a choice. It's a choice to believe in, in Christ. It's a choice to have that unshakable faith. It's all a choice. It's even a choice to say, you know what, Lord? I'm going to leave you out of this. It's all a choice. What we need to be asking ourselves is what choices are we making? The elders in verse 2 is talking about Abraham, Moses, David, even Sarah. They were all able to receive a good testimony and reputation, a good character, something to be known for, right? Something to be known for. That's why I believe our mothers, our moms, our mamas, and our wives have this great faith in them. Because by that faith, they leave a good testimony. By that faith, they leave a good reputation. By that faith, other families are established. The families of your children will be established by the faith that our mothers displayed. It trickles down, down the line. Because see, it's not about us. It's about our next generation. The children of Israel wandered around for 40 years. Right? They wandered around for 40 years when it should have been day's journey into the promised land. But the Lord did not allow them to enter into the promised land because they weren't ready. Their hearts weren't ready. And if you see in the scriptures, not everybody, Moses didn't even enter the promised land. So you ask yourself, so then, so then what was the reason then? What was the reason then to wander in the wilderness for so many years and to go through that process? And the answer is, it was to the next generation. It was for our children. It was for our kids, our kids' kids. That's what it's for. We go through that process in the wilderness sometimes where the Lord is molding us. He's trimming down those branches that aren't supposed to be there. He's up, he's killing the ground, and it's painful sometimes. And you ask yourself, why, Lord? 
Why do I have to go through this? It's so that through all that work, your faith is established and your next generation can be a part of that. Your next generation can benefit from it. Because by the, the faith and the love that our mothers displayed to us when we were kids, is how we display love to our children. Amen? So it's not just, it's not for us. It's for the next generation that's gonna enter. It's for the next generation that's gonna take it over after, after we're gone. That's what it's for. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Verse three says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. How many here know that intercessory prayer is powerful? Right? It's because somebody continued to pray for us is the reason why we're here. Amen? Because our mothers never gave up. Even though Moms probably didn't even know how it was going to be done, or when it was going to be done, or through who it was going to be done, but they knew, they knew that the Lord had something bigger for us. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Intercessory prayer is powerful. And it's through that faith that we get to know things that were not made visible. In order for us to see, we first must believe. And it shouldn't be the other way around, just like we're used to, before prior to coming to Christ. We want to see, so we can believe, right? We want the evidence, we want to see right in front of us what's going on, what am I getting myself into? We all like that. We like that guarantee, we like guarantees. We, we buy products because of the warranty, the guarantee. Right? Because we want to be safe. We want to play it safe. We want everything all unfolded be, be, uh, before us. But that's not faith. And that's definitely not the faith that the Lord has called us to walk in. If we're going to be servants of the Lord, if we're going to be true Christians, we need to walk and operate in that faith that is not seen. And we need to walk and operate in that faith that needs to be tested continually. Because faith that's not tested cannot be trusted. If you're not being tested, you're not growing. If you're not being tested, you're not being stretched. If you're not being tested, you're not moving forward. Amen? Amen. So ask yourselves today, are we being tested? And if you're not being tested, then that requires a hard examination. Because maybe your focus, or maybe the Lord, has been placed second. Like I said, again, if you give the Lord that, that position of second, he might as well be last. He requires and desires that number one spot, which he deserves rightfully. Amen? Amen. In context, true godly faith is defined as trust, relying on God when looking to the future not the past. That's something that's very important for you to realize this. Faith is trusting God and looking for the future, never the past. The past is already done. The past has already been written. And obeying even when we don't fully understand, which is a hard one for me sometimes. And I know it's a hard one for you guys. Obeying even when you don't fully understand how it's The great figures of the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, David, Sarah, to name a few, all lived according to this type of faith. Ultimately, that means trusting God's intent to make God make good on his promises. That type of faith should inspire all Christians for more confident, purposeful, 
faith. And it ultimately means trusting God. That's what it's about. Trusting God. Having that type of faith, having that unshakable faith. And remember that it's not for you. It's for the next generation that's going to come right after you. You want to be well known? You want to be always thought of? Always display that unshakable faith. And I guarantee you, your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids will always remember you by having that unshakable faith. That no matter what was going on, the world was falling around apart, was falling apart around you, you still stuck to that faith and you trusted God. And you made that choice to always put your trust in Him. That's what it's about. Amen? So whenever you're facing something that seems too big, too powerful, unfixable, remember what the Lord told Abraham when he told Sarah about having a child. Is something too big for the Lord? Is something too hard for the Lord? Or is something too unphysical, unfixable for the Lord? Let us not put God in a box because he doesn't belong there. And always put him first in everything you do. From the smallest thing to the biggest choices or the biggest decisions you have to make. If he is Lord, he needs to be Lord of all. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you today, Lord. And Father, we, we ask, Lord, that you help us, Father, to... Uh, Help us to put you first always, Lord. Father, I ask that you drown the noisiness, Lord, of this world, the distractions that this world has, Lord, that sometimes sometimes keeps us away from you, Lord. It keeps us from, from putting you first always. Father, I pray for all the mothers here, Lord. I pray and I thank, I thank you, Lord, for the love and the, and the faith that you've given them, Lord. That no matter what was happening, Lord, they never gave up on it. Father, we thank you, Father, for everything that you've done. Bless our, our day today, Father. And may your name be always, always be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.